Hi, this is Jay Pierce Dorf. Today, let's talk about color slides and how to get them into the digital world. Now, you might be the keeper of technology in your family, as I am in mine. So when there are people that, uh, that have color slides from past relatives or maybe your grandparents, uh, and they need to be brought into the digital world so that we can keep those memories alive, you might be the one that does the, uh, the transfer to get those color slides uh, into digital files that we can actually see on our phones or on our computers or on our TV sets or any of the modern appliances that we normally use. Very few people today still own slide projectors and of those slide projectors, very few of them actually work. Color slides, for those of you that uh, maybe aren't really familiar of them, were a way to take color photographs back in the 50s and up through the, even through the 80s, uh, we were taking a lot of color slides before digital cameras came out. And mostly we used Kodachrome and Ektachrome and uh, names like that. And perhaps your family has maybe hundreds or even thousands of color slides that are being saved, waiting to be archived. If you have an ILC camera, which is an interchangeable lens camera, you're probably, with, a, with one or two accessories, you're ready to tackle this job yourself and get those slides into digital files. Now, the first thing you could do is you could farm it out. Let's say, let's say you're, you're stuck. Well, hold it right there, Jay. I don't have an adjustable camera or an interchangeable lens camera, and I'm busy. I don't have the time to do this. And yes, I am the technology person in my family, but it's beyond me. Okay, so there are companies. Uh, ScanCafe.com is a good example. They'll do this for you. You box up the slides, send them off. 37 cents a slide at the time that this video was made is what it'll cost you to have them transferred into, a, uh, into digital files. And they also take um, home movies if you have 8mm Super 8 movies or even 16mm that need to be transferred to uh, Blu-ray disc, for example, or DVD. They can do that for you as well. But we're talking about color slides here. And in this case, uh, if we look through the color slides that, that I had to, uh, that my family left me to work with, we had well over 1,500. You can use a slide viewer, or you can use just a light table or a LED light table and use a magnifier. Now you wanna use something like a loop, which is L-O-U-P-E is like a jeweler's magnifier. And you wanna get one that's eight times or 10 times in strength. And that will let you put your, um, your eye right against right against the slide, and then you'll be able to uh, see if it's something that you want to spend the 37 cents on. So after doing some research on this, I discovered that 37 cents a piece was going to be about 500 bucks with Scan Cafe, uh, and I already had a, a very good digital camera. So I thought, well, why, is there a way that I could do this myself? And again, keeping your expectations in check. There are slides, professional slide scanners that can eke every bit of quality out of the original slide. And, and they're in the thousands of dollars. And there's some inexpensive ones, such you can get on Amazon, uh, you know, for several hundred dollars. And maybe even have an old flatbed scanner that has a slide or transparency attachment to it, and you could use and, and do a pretty decent job there. So the problem to me with, uh, with going with the flatbed scanners that were made a few years ago, they work pretty well, but they're really, really slow. And we're talking 1,500 slides. Okay, so that wasn't going to be a solution for me. And the other thing about flatbed scanners is they typically don't use a file format that allows you to do a lot of adjustments later in a program like Photoshop Elements or Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, by shooting in the raw file format, you can actually retain a lot of the dynamic range that color slides inherently had built in. This is a good thing. This means that your copies are going to be a lot more uh, realistic or have better dynamic range. So I settled on the uh, Nikon ES1 uh, slide copier. I'm gonna show that to you here. So this is not a standalone device. This does need um, your camera. So you're also gonna need a macro lens with this, and you're gonna need somewhere between a 40 millimeter for an APS-C sensor camera, or a 60 millimeter for a full frame camera. Now this is a pretty simple device. There's no optics in it. These are just two concentric tubes that you can bring these apart like this. So these slide in and out this fashion. And then you have a clip area here where your color slide um, will attach. It'll go in this way like this. And you have to make sure to get it under both clips there. 
And so it'll be in there like that. You have a, a frosted screen here in the front, which will diffuse the light that you're going to shine at it. And then your camera will attach to the back. Now this comes out of the box, comes with a 52 millimeter attachment ring, which, you know, that's designed to fit the Nikon uh, cameras. You don't have to use this on a Nikon camera. If you have any camera that has a 40 to 50 or 60 millimeter uh, macro lens on it, and you can get a step down ring to attach it to whatever filter size that you need. So in my case, I have a vintage 50 millimeter macro lens, uh, which was made for Minolta cameras. Um, and this was probably made in the, looks like it was made in the early 80s, maybe late 70s on this one. And the nice thing about uh, Minolta lenses is that they can be easily adapted to many mirrorless camera designs. And in this case, I'm using a, a Sony uh, a7R III, which I'm going to use as my uh, camera to shoot this with. So the task I have here, one, is to fit the Minolta lens onto the Sony camera body, which are not compatible. Even though Sony did buy Minolta, they didn't keep the mount. Okay, so the mount changes. So anyway, so that means we need an adapter. And you can buy an adapter fairly easily. These are not automatic, by the way. So these, this, they don't have any, um, there's no focusing mechanism attached. These are strictly manual focus when you're using a vintage lens like this. But for slides, or for, or for macro work for that matter, that's perfectly fine. So one other thing that comes with the, uh, the macro lens is an adapter uh, which gives you the one-to-one -one reproduction. So this is designed to go with the Minolta lens by putting these together. Now I, my macro lens is capable of shooting um, one-to-one -one or life-size, which is if you've got a full-frame sensor, for example, um, you can shoot the uh, slide um, life-size on the image. So the one other thing we need to add is the adapter, which allows us to put it on the Sony camera. So I'm going to attach this adapter. These are not very expensive, by the way. I'll put a link to all of these in the video notes. Just have to line up the red dots. And there we go. So the one other thing that has to happen now is I need to attach the Nikon ES-1 to the front here. Now, unfortunately, the Nikon ES-1 is 52 millimeters and the Minolta macro lens is 55 millimeters. So in that case, you can buy something called the step down ring. And that's what this is. This is the 55 to 52 millimeter step down ring. Now, if you think you might have uh, some uses for these in the future, you can buy a whole set of step down rings for a few dollars more that they sell on Amazon. The 52 millimeter side is going to go on the Nikon ES1. This will allow me to attach it to the 50 millimeter Minolta Macro. Then I'll put the whole thing onto the Sony A7R3. Okay, so that's what your complete setup looks like. Now, notice on here that um, this does rotate in the front. So this rotates like this because this has these tubes that come out. The idea is that you need to adjust this for the different lenses that you have um, to make the right distance where the slide fills the frame. So as you put the slide in there, that it's going to, it's going to fill the entire sensor. Now, I've got to have this set up where I'm going to rest this on the table so that the, the front of this is, is down as well as the back end of the camera. So the point of that is that this won't rotate because they're both sitting on the table or you can adjust a tripod to do this. And that way you can very quickly bring slides in, photograph them, and trade them out for the next one. One word on duplicating slides when you see these, these need to be set up where you see one side like this is shiny and usually convex. The other side has the printing on the mount, although not always, and the you can see kind of the uh, a relief or a bas relief of the image on that side, and the film is concave. So you want the convex side, or this facing away from the camera. So the convex side 
towards the lens like that. If you make a mistake, it just means your slide will print backwards. But you do have to focus these. And so if you if you have where these are all in pretty good shape and they all have about the right uh, bow on them, uh, I set my lens to about f8 and you can shoot that. And then you don't have to focus every single time. So let's set this up. Now we've got to have a light source in the front of this. Now I have a I have a light that I'm going to use to shine into the camera. And this is just a battery powered LED light. Um, this one, uh, it doesn't have to be big and doesn't have to be right on it, but this one has a, um, a light output that is daylight balanced, which I would recommend. Okay, so you see I have this aimed at the camera. This is my light right here. And this is the diffuse part. So I'm going to put that down there like that. And then if we look through, uh, you'll see that there, this is what I'm seeing through the camera. Now I'm going to um, put a slide in here. And if you do have slides that are shot horizontally, of course they will come, you have to put them in to fill the frame. You don't want to put them in the other direction. And now I'm going to try to focus with the, using the lens. I'm focusing with the lens like this. Okay. Now you can see that I haven't filled the frame. So I can adjust that by moving this closer like this. That's as close as I can get. And now I'm just about filling the frame, but I can't bring it into focus. Okay, so it's not quite focusable at that level. So I'm going to move this out just a little bit until it does come into focus, right about there. Maybe I'll make a little slack so I can I can adjust this. Now, there you can see, I do have my camera set to aperture priority on the Minolta lens, which is strictly manual at this point. Um, I can adjust the aperture. I can adjust the aperture right here. Most lenses are sharpest at about f8, so that's where I'm going to leave this on f8. You can see it's kind of hard to tell sometimes when you're in focus at f8, because you're looking at f8, it'd be easier to, to focus if you had it wide open. But in order to, um, to get around that, I have programmed uh, my camera, and you can do this with pretty much any interchangeable lens camera, where you can make a custom control, or you might already have a control that's defined in your camera, where you can press one of the custom buttons, in this case C1 on my camera. If I double press it, then it zooms in and allows me to look at the, the picture magnified. And here I can very easily focus right here. You can see I'm focusing on, on the grain or the, the dust on this image. You know, you're gonna old slides are gonna have a lot of a lot of dirt and dust, and you can clean them uh, with film cleaner and so on. I don't know that it's 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 worth your time depending on what you're gonna do. Uh, it wasn't for me. I used a little canned air to blow them off, and that's as far as I got with it. And then if I double click again, or just half press the shutter button, it returns the slide uh, to its full frame. You can also play around with the metering, uh, center weighting again on the metering. A lot of times slides, the subject was uh, the most important in the center that people shot, but that's up to you. And you do have a little more control over it if you are shooting in the raw file format. When you bring it into Lightroom, you'll be able to do some adjustments on that. So let's uh, go ahead and take this shot. I'm going to bring this into Lightroom and we'll make some more adjustments with it. And we will also, in this point, we will uh, crop it into there. In this case, I've got a 42 megapixel sensor. So it really uh, outperforms the resolution of the slide by quite a bit. So I can easily crop into this and the, the area that I lose will be insignificant. If you do have negatives that you need to process as well as slides, then you'll probably want to look at the Nikon ES2, which as well as having the slide capabilities, it also has the capabilities for um, processing negatives or they have little holders that you can put the negatives in and slide them one at a time 
um, through a similar mechanism. Okay, so hopefully that will help you get uh, great pictures using the Nikon ES1 slide copier. Remember, you don't have to have a Nikon camera to use this. You're going to need a lens that's in the 40 to 60 millimeter category. In this case, mine was a 50 millimeter. I couldn't shoot the image completely without doing some cropping. Now, if you intend to, to use JPEG format and you want to copy your slides and you don't want to mess with Photoshop or Lightroom or any of those, then you'll have to be more careful about how you crop them and you probably are going to need either the 40 millimeter for an APS-C sensor or the 60 millimeter for a, a full frame camera. Now, there, you don't, again, doesn't really matter the brand on those as long as it's a macro lens. There is uh, some under $200, which is made by um, a company called Artisan, which have gotten very good reviews. And again, they're manual focus, manual aperture. But in this case, that works perfectly fine. All right, everybody. Hope that helps. Talk to you later.